on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I can see the bigger publishers becoming uh, much more risk averse. I can see lots of authors, really good authors who kind of sit on the mid list who are going to be thinking, well, what do I do next? And so I think, you know, if you're going to survive in the 21st century as a, as a writer, particularly if it's some um, uh, genre fiction, you're going to have to embrace this stuff. You're going to have to get your head around it. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello, it's The Self-Publishing Show. Uh, my name is James Blatch. My name is Mark Dawson. We are smooth as a baby's bottom in the way we do our openings and closings now. We're there, I think. Oh my goodness, this could, this could get even more dodgy than normal. Yes, but I think the traditional retort is, yeah, a baby baboon, which I think is a um, Steve Martin gag from somewhere or other. Okay, um, let's uh, get straight on with it. We've got a, a packed show and a good interview uh, this week with, with some um, uh, another double act in the indie podcast sphere. Are they as funny as us, the two marks? Um. Well- are we funny? That's the, I think that's the kind of starting point. I'm not entirely sure we are. So bearing that in mind, they couldn't be more funny. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we've got a, an interview with the bestseller Experiment Crew today. Uh, well, one half of the uh, the double act coming up, and it's a really good interview. So stay tuned for that, as they used to say on the radio. First, I'd like to do, uh, Mark, is to welcome our new Patreon supporters who have gone to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and they are greg evans from wangara in wa in western australia uh, de haggerty uh, adam Locke, jeremy mckay from vancouver in canada and peter lacy so greg de haggerty adam jeremy and peter thank you so much indeed for supporting us on the podcast it means a lot to us vancouver in canada i'm hatching a secret plan that uh, we may get to vancouver in canada in the autumn Jeremy and uh, we're uh, going to perhaps host a mini SPF get together one night because I know we've got a lot of people in that area um, and we've got a few interviews to pick up in that area so who knows we may even stick a camera in your face okay uh, what else we're we going to talk about we have got you've got a PA uh, do you know what a PA is in the industry well, I do because we recorded this yesterday before my camera packed up. So a PA is a personal appearance, I think. Um, and yes, I've got two actually. What was the first one? That's right. The first one I'm, I'm actually doing um, what what I think our American friends would call a commencement address um, at my alma mater. Uh, this in is... English, my my old school. <laughs> yeah. Um, Were and, you giving um, a speech at your old school? If that's pretty much the top and bottom of it, yeah. So I'm going back there um, in May. So that that one is not open to the public. That'll be me talking to a lot of bored 16 and 17 year olds about why they should consider writing rather than what their teachers have told them to do. The other thing I'm doing is uh, it's called Slaughter in Southwold, which is a very odd title for um, a crime convention in a very very pretty uh, small town, large village. Um, near where I come from on the east coast of the UK, uh, otherwise known as Chelsea on Sea because it's very expensive. Lots of uh, Victorian terraces changing hands uh, to bankers from London for uh, six and seven figures. But they have um, a lovely library there and they've got an annual uh, crime convention. And this year will be attended by people like Val McDermott, who is very well known as a crime thriller writer, um, Mick Heron, who writes. Uh, kind of slightly offbeat espionage um, stories. Uh, who else? Nikki French and six or seven others and me. Um, so I'll be speaking, I think it's the 16th, the Sunday the 16th of June, I think it is, um, at 10 o'clock in the morning um, in Southwold. So if you're in the area or if you fancy a trip to the seaside, uh, come and um, and say hello to me. I don't have the URL right now, but if you do slaughter in Southwold, Google will help you out and we'll, uh, if we remember, we'll pop it in the show notes as well. Yes, that would be good. Go and press the flesh, meet meet the Dawson on his PA. I've heard you'll turn up at the opening of an envelope. I will. Actually, I'm going to... I'm, I didn't tell you this. I'm going to one tonight, actually. I've been nominated for an award. <gasps> yeah, the Wiltshire Life. Um, 
Wiltshire Life Awards, I can't remember what category I'm in. I think it's a, it's kind of an artistic category. So there's me and three others, a theatre. Um, so me against the theatre. <laughs> a bricks um, and mortar building. Uh, yeah. Are you going, is this a black tie event? It is a black tie event, yep. So I'm going in my monkey seat and um, Mrs. Dawson will be looking lovely in her posh frock. So we're off there at uh, half six tonight. So the kids are taken care of, and um, I don't think I'll we'll win, but uh, that's fine. I don't. I don't normally expect to win these things, but it's a it's a cheap night out. Excellent. Well, pictures already didn't happen tomorrow. Yes, that's true. I will try and take some pictures. Stick them on the community group. Good. Uh, well, we've got our one hundred and one launch out of the way. We're starting to turn our minds to uh, uh, some revisions and preparation for ads for authors opening up um, in the summer. I think May is when we're scheduled for that. Um, but I have been doing something very exciting this week. So you and I started talking to Susie Quinn last year. Now, if you cast your mind back a long time, back in the old days when we were just called a podcast, uh, we had Susie Quinn on. She's a very successful romance writer. Uh, well, not romance, sort of a chick list, actually, not romance, I think. I hope we can call it chick list. You told me off once. Mm, I don't I'm not even sure I'd call it that, James. She does lots of things. She does lots of things, but she writes really funny uh, books about women. There you go. And uh, she's brilliant. And she understands her craft. She's been hugely successful, and she has put together a, a course for us. So we started talking about this. She came to us with the idea. And I'm now mid-editing this course. It's called How to Write a Bestseller, and it is sensational. It's brilliant. It should be required viewing for authors and publishers. Uh, she really sets out why the industry works as it does at the moment and how we can approach writing to get it right commercially, to sell books. Oh, excuse that noise. Um, and uh, it's layered, and I'm really excited. I'm intrigued uh, editing it. So this has been my exciting thing to do this week, and we're going to get this done in the next few weeks, and then we'll talk about how we're going to to launch this. It'll be a standalone course. It's not something we normally do. In fact, you deliberately, Mark, held off for a long time on doing anything on craft because it you felt it just wasn't something you could personally teach. I probably could teach it, but it's not something I just don't have time really. And I I think to teach that successfully, you need to really kind of um, analyze your process. And I'm slightly reluctant to do that um, in the kind of, I don't want to jinx myself too much. I've, I've got a system that works pretty well for me and I don't, I almost don't think about it too much. It's kind of something that's instinctive now. And I think if I started to um, work out exactly what I do when I'm writing, it might make it less magical that kind of sounds terribly pretentious but it's kind of kind of how i feel about it but um i will have some no i have some ideas i'm looking forward to seeing um susie's course i haven't seen it yet i know it will be high quality um and well we don't put anything out with the spf um badge on it if it isn't high quality um so you know we we will make sure it is it's it's top notch and definitely looking forward to getting a bit more information uh, about that course out there well one thing we will do um uh, is definitely do a webinar with Susie and get her to divulge some of the secrets, a lot of the secrets in a webinar so people can get a good idea of her teaching style. Uh, she released Don't Tell Teacher this week uh, and it went into the top 50 within three days of launch, so another bestseller uh, to her name. So she is somebody like you, Mark, who walks the walk as well as talks the talk. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of people who, do, who don't do that. So it is... Um especially James is uh, expiring off camera. So um, yeah, if plenty of people who, who, who are doing courses these days and they, you know, if you, if you look at their sales rankings and they're not actually selling any books, you might reasonably ask the question, what can they teach me? Um, but Susie isn't like that. Um, I like to think I'm not like that either. So there are certainly some, uh, some good, some good stuff coming down the track from us. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Right. Should we get on with uh, this week's interview? It is with Mark Stay from the Bestseller Experiment. Talking of bestsellers, I was going to do a seed. Then you, you beat me to it. I, talk, I could have said, "I'm talking of bestsellers, uh, James." It's just like listening to Radio Two. Radio, <laughs> what did they call it on um, Radio Smooth on the? Um, Smashy and nicey. Smashy and nicey. That would mean nothing to our American friends. No, but yes. right. That's, uh, they should, that's YouTube. You can get some smashy and nicey action on there. Um, yes, the bestseller experiment. So it started uh, what, probably three years ago, I'm going to guess now. Um, and it really was, as Mark Stay explains in this interview, he and another Mark just having a conversation, realizing they both enjoyed writing. Mark Stay's got a fantastic film uh, credit uh, to his name. Uh, I think Gillian Anderson was in it and somebody else big as well. I must have looked, should have looked it up before the interview. I'm sure he mentions it. You're so professional. I'm so professional. Not as like you, Smoothie. And they, um, 
They basically have blogged their journey in setting out to write and sell a bestseller, and it's something that they achieved as well. They're now in the second stage of that. It's a fascinating story. It's a really good listen. Um, they're not quite as funny as me and Mark when we get going, but you know they they put the effort in, which is good. Um, good. All right. So let's listen to Mark's day, and then Mark, you and me will be talking again off the back. And there's that noise again. There's that. Noise. Let's listen to the interview. <laughs> This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Excellent, Mark Stay from one podca- pod- podcaster, podcaster, <laughs> a, a pod. Well, do you know what a podcaster is? It's a combination of a broadcaster and a podcaster. And I can see you've got a BBC News windshield on your microphone. So, well, I I found that in the gutter at Oxford Circus. I, uh, this is a weird, weird story. I I won a raffle to me. Uh, Jeremy Vine at BBC Two, okay? And my wife and I got off the tube at Oxford Circus and we were crossing the street and I saw this microphone muffler in the gutter and I thought, I'll have that. Because <laughs> yes. Thought, but it makes it, it and it's it's a conversa- it's an icebreaker. It's a conversation starter for a moment. It's just like this. But yeah, it's great. I love it. Wouldn't go back. It's, um, yeah, it's why, amazing what you'll why, find in the gutters in Oxford yeah. Circus. <laughs> just outside the BBC. Strange that. Yeah. Oh, well, why not? Well, look, Mark, uh, from the Best Seller Experiment, welcome to uh, the self-publishing show. We're both Thank you. doing the same sort of thing in the same space. And the first thing to say is what a fun community self-publishing is to be in, isn't it? They're fantastic. It is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I've worked in book selling and publishing for, you know, 25 odd years now. And there was always a, a people could be very, very snooty about self publishing. And I must confess that back in the day, I was one of those people. But having seen it evolve into something that is not only legitimate, but um, is actually something that I've embraced and something that I think has a great future. And I I mean, I would classify myself as a a hybrid author. I'd like to do a bit of both working with publishers and publishing my own stuff. And frankly, I think that's how the the future is going to be. I mean, I can see the bigger publishers becoming uh, much more risk averse. I can see lots of authors, really good authors who kind of sit on the mid list who are going to be thinking, well, what do I do next? And so I think, you know, if you're going to survive in the 21st century as a, as a writer, particularly if it's um, some genre fiction, you're going to have to embrace this stuff. You're going to have to get your head around it. So, uh, and it is a fantastic community. It's, it's some, you know, like, like yourself, we have our own listener community. We share stuff on our Facebook page. People chip in with the most amazing advice and encouragement. Uh, and I learn, I've learned tons from it and I know how our listeners have. So, and it's, um, it's one of the reasons why we've kept the bestseller experiment going. Yes, because you basically, we'll come on to that, I think, a bit later, but you basically uh, achieved your aim amazingly, and um, uh, it's it's a good reason to keep it going, is, I think, now to inspire other people to do what you did. But uh, before we get there, I just want to delve into your background a little bit, Mark. So you say you came from traditional publishing. I think you had uh, quite a long stint. Talk to me about what you were doing uh, in the industry at that point. Um, I, I've, I, well... I wanted to act. I don't know how far back you want to go, but my wife and I both got places at drama school. My wife got the grant. That's how old I am. Um, and I was working at Waterstones at the time, which I thought was going to be a Christmas job. And I said, well, look, you go to drama school. I'll, I'll you know, I'll stay at Waterstones, help pay the rent, blah, blah, blah. And um, I love you know, I love reading like a lot of people. I love writing. And we started around theatre company once Claire left drama school. And I wanted to do a Johnny Spate play, but he'd uh, passed away and I couldn't get the right. So I had a theatre booked and no play. And I'd always dabbled in playwriting. I'd always I'd written tons of sketches at school, but never written a full length play. And I wrote a play in about eight weeks. We wrote it, rehearsed it, staged it. And it went down a storm. It was just brilliant. And a friend of mine who worked, uh, he was just a cable basher at the time on things like TFI Friday, but he makes documentaries now. We're all sort of starting out together. He said, there's too many actors, but not enough writers and you can write. And that was that moment of validation that I always needed. That, I, that again, I hit, we hear this from our listeners that, you know, you just need someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, yeah, this is good. Keep at it. Keep doing it. And so we did a play a year for a few years. Um, one of those plays I turned into a screenplay uh, that got optioned. I met a few producers. I met a filmmaker called John Wright, uh, who he and I worked on a couple of low budget ideas. And one day out of the blue, 
Uh, he came out with an idea for a film called Robot Overlords, which we wrote together. And that was made into a film. And in parallel to this, I was sort of, you know, I still had a day job. I was working my way through. Uh, I worked at Headline Publishing for a while. And then about 15 years ago, I joined Orion Publishing. And for over 10 years, I looked after the Amazon account. So my day to day was looking at Amazon, looking at the back end of Amazon through what they call Vendor Central, which is a lot like uh, Amazon Associates, and, uh, which a lot of your listeners will be familiar with, only much more complicated and messed up. And, <laughs> and uh, it was... Uh, <sighs> First of all, I started selling to Amazon, but of course, we've all stopped selling to Amazon. Uh, most of my day was spent putting out fires on Amazon uh, because the following the self-publishing boom, the catalog on Amazon is just enormous and things go wrong with it all the time. And again, as your listeners will know, and my job was to go in there and fix stuff. So I got a very good uh a very good background in how Amazon works, the kind of stuff that they do, the things that can go wrong, how you can fix them, uh, which has served me well, you know. Uh, but even so, it's it's different when it's your own book. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting though that you had this this view of the the professional back end of Amazon that the um, the industry see. Um, you know, without breaking any uh, confidentiality agreements that you may have signed at the time, do they get any kind of preferable terms? Is it? Is there, is there kind of a them and us between a, a, you and I setting up and uploading our book onto KDP and thinking, well, there's my 70% or whatever it is. Is there a different deal done for big publishers? No, I think um, the key to understanding Amazon and the way that Amazon deals with everyone, and this is absolutely key to understanding Amazon, is they do everything for the customer. They have a word that whenever I've been to head office, you see this in, uh, word on posters, it's customer centric. Uh, they're, a bad day for them is when a customer is unhappy and everything is geared towards delivering promises for the customer, which is why. So if publishers ran out of stock of a particular title, uh, you'll see a message come up saying um, unavailable should be back in stock one to three weeks, which was so frustrating because we knew stock was coming in tomorrow. We'd had a reprint. We knew it would be with them in a day or so. Why not put a couple of days? Amazon will not keep a promise that they themselves cannot keep. And so you get authors, understandably, very, very frustrated by this. Um, but it was all geared to making sure that Amazon delivered. So when the book does arrive in a couple of days, the, the customer who's previously seen one to three weeks gets the book and goes, oh, aren't Amazon good? Oh. You know, so, which is why people keep coming back. But they... Everything, every time they're being difficult, every time you think they're they're causing problems, they're generally not. They are generally doing everything for the customer because they they live in fear of losing a customer. And I've experienced that on, you know, the traditional publishing side and on and on this side of the fence as well. It's one of the reasons they're so keen on print on demand is that they um they want to be able to control the distribution of everything. So uh, that's that's why they're so keen on Simpub. Because they want to say, look, if a book is coming on X date, why can't the customers get it on Kindle, on audio, on, on paperback, in a hardcover, whatever format they're offering? Why can't it be, uh, you know, seamless across, you know, I want to put down my Kindle and pick up and pick up where my pick up with my audio book where I left off. All of that thing is all geared towards making uh, that, that customer environment, that customer experience as good as possible. And it doesn't matter how big you are. It all comes down to that. Yeah. Well, look, it's a formula that's worked extremely well for them and mm. um, undeniably in black and white, uh, the organization has grown. Um, yeah. And as I consume, I look forward to that SimPub day as well. In fact, it's all technologically possible now and it should be seamless. And uh, there may come a time where Amazon starts to say to, to somebody, if you're going to publish, you need to publish, a, you know, make it a bit more forced upon you but we'll see okay well we'll come on to some nitty gritty stuff um in time so you've gone through traditional publishing you're there at an interesting time as uh, as ebooks happen yeah you see the back end of, uh, of amazon and then at some point you think about writing is that whilst you're still there or is that did that come after you'd left uh it started I mean, obviously obviously after the film i don't want to say that's not writing that was absolutely brilliant of you to have <laughs> written that and get that film made but i'm talking about the novel well, then, I mean, the uh, 
the probably the best thing I did in retrospect was write the novelization of Robot Overlords. We were in uh, post production and the producers were getting very excited. They were saying, "Oh, we could do a game. We could do this. We could do a book. I'll do the book." Immediately put my hand up. Oh, I'll, I'll do it, and I know who can publish it. And um, actually, Galantz took a lot of convincing to publish it. I had to do them a little. I had to write like three sample chapters. I had to do a little PowerPoint presentation with some of the previews from the film just to prove it was real, you know. And they took a risk. They they did say, look, you know, we don't we don't publish staff. We don't publish mates. Uh, you've you've got to prove that this is good enough. So. I wrote uh, about 10,000 words of stuff that wasn't in the film, sort of precursor to the film itself, and um, off we went. So I had an editor, Gillian Redfern, who was just amazing. And unlike a lot of tie-in novels, which are written by someone who had nothing to do with the film in about six weeks, I had about eight months, and um, I was heavily involved, and we were in post-production, so I could see what the visual effects were looking like. I, I knew of all the changes to the script, I, and there's all kinds of stuff in the book that's not in the film that weaves in and out. So, um, you know, it was it was a great experience. It's it's nice to have seen customer reviews saying, you know, this enhances the film, this is, you know, or, or works as a standalone book. And that's what put me in touch with um, Mark DeVoe, her, my co-presenter of The Bestseller Experiment, because... Uh, he came out of the woodwork. He, we'd known each other when we were teenagers. We didn't go to the same school, but we had lots of mutual friends. And Mark is one of these guys who's always doing something extraordinary. He started the first, uh, I think it was the first um, online real estate company in the UK. Uh, he's been project manager in charities and all sorts of extraordinary projects. And you bump into people and say, oh, what's Devo up to these days? And say, well, he's, um, he's DJing at Glastonbury. He's what? You know, stuff like that. So we had this conversation where he said, you know what? I've always wanted to write a novel, but I've never got beyond 20,000 words. And we both love podcasts. And we were both saying, you know, there must be a lot of people out there in the same boat a lot of people who've started a novel got stuck didn't know where to turn didn't know where else to go and so we set ourselves a challenge to to not only write a novel but top the kindle charts within 12 months uh and the the key thing that we did the thing that i think really helped uh, get the podcast going was we said to our listeners beat us to it you know, there's bound to be people out there with a half written novel in a drawer or an idea, or maybe they've finished a book and just need to revise it. Uh, beat us to it. We'll get great guests on every week who will talk to us about the craft of writing and, and, and sort of insider knowledge on publishing. And they did. They absolutely did. You know, so many of our listeners have now got deals or, you know, for, it started out people just saying, oh, you know, what? I finished my book. It's fantastic. Thank you. Blah, 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 which was great. But now we've got people getting three book deals with Golance, with Hero, with Avon, with HQ. Um, you know, so we've got this great alumni of uh, of, of listeners who've, who've now got great deals. And it, that's one of the reasons we, we kept it going, um, because we just love, you know, hearing their success stories and we love talking to authors. Yeah, that's brilliant. And you're you sat down then with your colleague Mark. It's another Mark Devereux. Yes, it? another Mark. Yeah, yeah, Mark another Devereux. Mark, Mark Devereux. Um, how did you approach the actual genre and the work split? Because there's no guarantee at the beginning of this process that you're both interested in the same things. No, it was. Um, I mean, we're both blokes from Surrey with a similar sensibility in in many ways. He's, uh, I mean, at, certainly at the beginning as well, and this is still there to a certain extent, he's a life coach. That's what he does now. So he's, his day is telling everyone, you've got a dream. I can help make that dream. Anything is possible. Whereas I was a cynical old goat who'd been working in publishing for nearly 25 years. And I was like, look, more books fail than succeed. This could be a complete and utter car crash. There's no guarantee this is actually going to happen. And uh, we went in eyes wide open with the possibility that it could it could completely fail and we put together a spreadsheet of all the things that we liked uh the things that put a fire in our belly the things that we hated the things that made us angry that we were passionate about and we put together uh, a kind of we 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 looked at the sort of Venn di diagram of of what we both liked and we ended up with science fiction humor music uh, and what also became apparent during our, our early conversations with uh, guests on the show is that of the readers out there um, women are much more voracious readers that they're, they're also 
much more uh, likely to tell their friends about a book. Blokes tend to uh, latch on to an author and collect everything that author has. You know, if they like Clive Cussler, they're going to buy all the Clive. If they like Jack Reacher, they buy all the Jack Reacher. Women go to book groups, they swap books, they talk about books all the time. So we, and they make up the majority of readers. So we needed to write a book that appealed to that market primarily as well. So we had a female protagonist for our book too. Um, and we started putting together the book that became Back to Reality, which we pitch as a sort of uh, Back to the Future meets Freaky Friday. And um, we did a lot of outlining a lot of outlining to start with, which led to the infamous Ben Aronovich episode of the podcast where, which we call the, uh, can I swear on this? Uh, we we call it the, we call it the Ben Aronovich bollocking, uh, which <laughs> he discovered our outline was 50,000 words long and he's yelling at us has become the stuff of legend, but it, it gave us the, the kind of fright that we needed. We were six months into the project to actually get on with the actual book and the way it worked from then, I was the much more experienced writer. So I would write during the day. And because Mark DeVoe is in Canada, he would read while I slept and he would make notes and essentially do an edit. It was like having a live in editor. It's every author's worst nightmare. But it was fantastic because the next morning I get notes from him and suggestions and little he'd write bits himself and it'd be uh, and you wake up, you go. Okay, yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? Okay, and you'd rewrite that, and then you'd write a little more and write, a little, and it actually worked really, really well. I mean, it was very, you know, very frustrating. It was a new way for me to do something, and waking up every morning being told what you've just written is wrong, you know, could <laughs> could lead to. Uh, um, but it it worked. It really, really worked. And then we uh, gave the book to our our editor. Uh, we also gave it to our beta readers as well, who gave us all sorts of notes. Um, and it was a it was a hair raising process because it was right up to the last minute. We were um, formatting the sort of the night before publication, and uh, you know it was spotting typos at the last minute. And um, it was I mean it's not an exercise I would ever want to repeat. Let's put it like that. But it was it, I'm so glad I did it. And then we had our launch day, uh, which um, was October exactly a year after October 16th, 2017. And we uh, started getting reviews in, which was great. We had a, a day-long YouTube live podcast. Uh, all our listeners got involved. And the first we got the first um, little uh, orange bestseller tag around about mid-morning in the UK. And that was first of 10 across across the world so uh we did it we did it it was great we we did what we set out to achieve but what we discovered of course um is that's only only the beginning um and we were uh wiped out by the experience um we had not put really enough thought into how we market the thing post publication and what happened next was we had a pretty rotten year um uh, poor Mr. DeVoe, his, um, his wife became very ill and she went into palliative care and he has a family. And so he spent much of 2018 looking after her. Sadly, she, she passed away. So he had just the worst year ever. And I had a choice, which was, do I keep the podcast going or do we market the book? I couldn't really do both and have a full-time job. And so I kept the podcast going, uh, mainly because I love talking to authors and editors and I love the process and I'm learning stuff from it myself all the time. And we, you know, we, 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 we kept the thing going and, um, uh, Mr. DeVoe is now back on the show. I was made redundant from Orion just before Christmas, so I've got a lot more time on my hands. And we've set ourselves a new challenge in 2019. Our book uh, climaxes at the Glastonbury Music Festival. And we've challenged ourselves. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. We've challenged ourselves to sell 10,000 copies of Back to Reality by Glastonbury weekend, June 30th. And we are doing that by marketing the socks off it. I'm doing Mark's course, you know, I'm working my way through that learning crash course and the steep learning curve. Uh, it's definitely helping. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we've challenged our listeners. This is the other thing that was missing from our second year. We've, we've said to our listeners, look, you know, if you've got a book out, and we know a lot of them do, uh, but it's to it, you know, let's, let's, let's learn from each other. 
And uh, again, that's already working. We're already getting the best advice from our listeners. And um, it's, uh, it's become part of my day. I write in the morning and then I'm marketing in the afternoon. And um, yeah, we're learning a lot. Still got a hell of a way to go, though. <laughs> the, um, the power of a deadline, though, when you set a deadline, and although it, it takes its toll on you, uh, and we should just say that our hearts go out to Mark and, uh, you know, it dwarfs everything else that you and I will talk about uh, when that level of life intervenes. And so our thoughts are with him, of course, and his family um, from that episode. But, but he's back. Um, you're moving on together now. And as you say, it's the shift in emphasis on the podcast is from craft and writing, although you did talk about marketing, um, mm. to more about this this sort of marketing techniques and where you're going with that. Now, have you made any big early discoveries? Um, we should have written a series. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we probably should have written a thriller because um, that's where all the good money is these days. But um, no, we're discovering uh, the granularity of it and we're discovering that we need to build our audience as well. So we need to... Dis- the problem you have on the podcast is our, our audience on the podcast are all writers and some write romance, some write thrillers, some write science fiction, some write fantasy, YA, what, all, all kinds of stuff. So the book doesn't necessarily appeal to all of our listeners. We need to find a new audience uh, out there of people who love comedy, contemporary fiction, you know, with a little science fiction twist. I remember doing a presentation at the RNA talking about our book and saying, you know what, there's not a single book out there like it. Rowan Coleman put her hand up (laughs) and said, actually, The Summer of Impossible Things, which is a Zoe Ball book club book, uh, is a lot like that. And funny enough, I, I read it and I thought, that's our audience. That's our readership, you know. And we got the cover completely wrong completely wrong uh looking back the original cover for our book looks like a self-help book you know we even have a shout shout line that is what if you could change your life um so we've gone to demonza we are completely revamping the cover we're gonna have a cover reveal for that very soon and it's a lot more in that kind of contemporary women's fiction market um so that was a big lesson for us and that was again that was something we did we got a great designer on board he worked to our brief but we didn't have that separation it's one of the things that publishers do really really well is they will give you separation they might give you a cover that you might think oh that's not the cover i wanted but very often it is the right cover for the market uh because they do know their market and that's where someone at demons was very good because we yes we completed a brief but it was a very very thorough questionnaire and they gave us four very different styles of covers uh, but there was one very clear winner. Um, and of course, we have some kind of distance between us and the original book now where we can actually look back at it and go, ah, yeah, we were completely wrong on that. That that cover is actually killing us. So um, hopefully new cover will help boost sales soon. Uh, we're doing tons on metadata and keywords, uh, just that basic front of store stuff, constantly changing it. Again, this is stuff we just never had time to, to address or, or do properly. And of course, when there's two of you, you kind of think it would be easier, but of course you don't want to go, you have to agree everything before you can go ahead and do these things as well you know so it's um it almost slows things down a bit but um yeah mr d is back he's an incredible person i don't know where he gets his drive from um but yeah he is back and he has a very canny business mind as well so um yeah uh it's it's a challenge i'm not sure we're going to make it but you know we've always said to people it part of the fun of this show is it, it's always promised to be a car crash of a, of a kind so you know just join us and in, enjoy the ride and um yeah and like i said beat us to it if you're out there beat us to it well the um the bestseller experiment is itself a thriller <clears throat> with jeopardy who knows whether you're going to make it or not and uh, the it first really time is. it's not quite a ticking bomb on the train but nonetheless um yeah i mean the cover just on that obviously it's absolutely crucial we talk a lot about it on this podcast is the yeah. scan time somebody has on amazon uh, mm. And the, the number one thing it has to do is to say what it is to you. It doesn't matter how pretty it is or the rest of it. Mm. And if it, if at a glance it says something else than the book is, obviously that's a, a I mean, it's, it's such a significant problem for you to move forward. So that'd be an mm. interesting cover reveal when you, um, are you going to show mm. the also rans as well? Well, we've already run it. We have a, 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 a private Facebook group for our Patreon supporters and we did some extensive polling with them and we got a ton of feedback, a ton of feedback. And it was interesting. They, they, 
you hear the same things again. And when you hear those commonalities, it's like when you get an edit back from an editor, you, you know, pick out the commonalities, pick out or beta reader feedback, you know, uh, see where the bumps in the road are. The comments that come back might not chime with you, but you have to appreciate there's some kind of problem. But there was one very, very clear winner, uh, you know, head and shoulders above all the others. And it was the one that we really liked as well. So, um, yeah, we may, I'm sure we'll do that. But there's a part of me that thinks, how does that help us, you know, if we were already putting mm-hmm. it out there? But um, we are we are probably going to do variations on the cover that we've chosen. There's, there's little things like just basic things like do you have capital letters for the title do mm-hmm. you have lowercase little things like that little bits of positioning the shout line we want to change constantly and tinker with that and again that's something publishers do indie authors do all the time and these things can make all the difference and uh, and who knows in in eight months time you might find the cover is 12 months might already feel a bit old hat so you might have to do it again it's um particularly contemporary fiction it's a market that's always shifting always moving forward so uh you know you really have to keep an eye on the competition there and see what they are doing yeah and um you mentioned separation having that separation was helpful because i mean mm. that's something else that's unique really to self publishers and in, in traditional publishing you get somebody who's got how many books on the on the go at one time i don't know but they have your book suddenly in front of them and they say okay we're going to do this john we're going to do that this that and the other and they have a very clinical business like it's not their baby approach it, which yeah. is exactly what your writer needs to do in the afternoon. They need to look yeah. at that book they're writing in the morning, forget it's theirs, look at it as a marketing asset and work out what changes you're going to do. And it's, it's difficult, right? Mm. Yeah, it really is. And it's, um, you'd think it would come more readily with experience, but, uh, you know, when it's your baby, when, I mean, the big, the big lesson I've learned is not to worry about the specifics. I mean, I, I read Rowan's book, uh, which is a wonderful read, and it is about time. It's about a woman, a British woman, who time travels back to the seventies in New York. There's a Saturday Night Fever thing going on. It's 1977. Uh, the streets are kind of dangerous. They're in, and then you look at her cover, and it's two women at a tree. And you think, I, I remember a mention of a tree in maybe one chapter. I don't remember, you know, where's the disco? And of course, those aren't the things that hook that readership in. The things that hook that readership in are relationships and the colours and, a, 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 you know, a great image and a great shout line. So we kind of, you know, for our one, we had all kinds of clutter on the cover that we thought, oh, it's important. We need to represent that. Oh, and we need to represent that. And this is important. And, we, and it was just, it ended up almost pebble dashing the cover with uh, with too much info so you know we simplified and we went with a great image and you know we were very keen that we get the right color scheme on there the right kind of font those are the really important things and of course the shout line and the copy which again you can change at any time but it was something we we, we thought long and hard about yeah just a quick question on the bestseller uh, ticks that you got the orange ticks did you seek them out by placing in certain categories in the metadata and so on? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. We did a lot of research beforehand looking at, uh, what, you know, because obviously you, the, the odds of you getting fiction general, number one, you know. Uh, um, but we um, we definitely did. And we went down that Douglas Adams, uh, Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett route quite strongly because uh, one of our, our favourite number ones, it was a weird one for, for we were in um, science fiction humour number one, you know, and of course I'm there with my heroes, Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. I'm at number one and they're at number two and three, which is just, you know, it's not, that's wrong. That's completely wrong. Um, but it made our day. We did tweet Neil and he replied to us and retweeted us, which was, you know, probably the best part of the whole day. Um so yeah, we we did think long and hard about that, but of course you can't. The the fact is that readership is looking for uh, something where that that genre is a bit more full on, whereas us it's quite lightly spread. If you see, if if you've watched Back to the Future, you can read our book. You don't need to understand time travel. You just need to understand the story about a woman and her dreams and her daughter and her mother. That's the core to the whole thing. And again, like Rowan Coleman's book, you know, the science fiction is never explained. No one has to sit down and explain how it, it just happens. It's just one of these what if scenarios, much like sliding doors as well. And, you know, th- 
that market, I think you need something different to hook them in. You need the relationships, you know, you need the the promise of something a little bit deeper than a bit of a fun romp. So, uh, yeah, that's um, those are going to be the much the, the slightly more difficult genres to conquer, if you like. But um, that's where I think we'll find more readers. Uh, and again, those kind of readers that we talked about in those early episodes who will evangelize and hand the book around. Of course, we haven't done a print version of this either. We didn't do print on demand. We're going to be doing that as well. So um, just it's so much easier just to hand someone a book and uh, say, hey, you'll really like this. So, um, yeah, it's uh, still a lot of unknown variables. But like I say, we're learning every day. And it's unfolding in front of us. And you've written another book, Mark. Are you, mm. You've had a traditionally published book this year? Yeah, it's um, at the time of recording. It's out in uh, three days. Uh, it's a fantasy oh, novel. Okay. Uh, it's called The End of Magic, and it's published by Unbound. So I had to crowdfund that. That was another uh, experiment, and I learned a lot doing that as well. Um, but it's uh, it's a fantasy novel that I put aside for the first year of the podcast. It was what I was working on when Mark DeVoe called me. And I'd had a draft done and I thought, okay, I'll put it aside for a bit and see how this goes. And of course, as you know, podcasts are all consuming. So uh, I had to put it away for for a year. Um, but then I got back on with it. I said to my agent, look, where can we place this? Uh, who, who can we get this to? And he mentioned that an editor who I'd known in the past, a guy called Simon Spanton, who uh, has worked with authors like Scott Lynch and Joe Abercrombie and Richard Morgan. And he's a really, really nice guy. He had moved to Unbound. And I said, great, let's go after Simon. I like Simon. He likes me. I think he'll like this. He'll do a great job on this. And he said, and my editor said, and my agent said, oh, one catch is Unbound. You have to crowdfund. And so I had to raise about five grand in 90 days, uh, which was, um, yeah, again, a very steep learning curve. Um, but I did it. And the book, Simon did a fantastic job with the edit. And I have an amazing copy editor called Lisa Rogers as well. Um, Unbound put the most amazing cover art on it too, just by Mark E. Cobb. And um, yeah, it's out this Thursday. It's a uh, fantasy. It's called The End of Magic. It's, um, well, we've all heard that story of how, you know, the young ingenue discovers they might have some kind of magical power and they meet a mentor or a wizard and they or they go to a wizard school and they learn and they usually have a face off with some kind of dark lord i've seen star wars exactly uh, yeah. i wanted to completely reverse that i wanted someone who's had magic for some time who's become reliant on it who is somewhat cocky about it is somewhat privileged and I wanted to take that away from them and then torture them for about 350 pages, uh, which I do. So it's um, it's about a, a mage to a king, a man called Sanderbury, who is a very powerful mage, has everything done for him, lives a very, very cushy life, and yet still he complains. And he's about to go on a, a quest that would have been difficult with magic and is nigh impossible without it. And then magic goes. Everything in this world, the magic is gone. And uh, it's about how he copes with that and how he discovers who he really, really is. Uh, there's, uh, and it's a, is this a Brexit metaphor? <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> you should say that. About halfway through the second draft, Brexit was really happening. I was thinking, oh, <laughs> is this... End of magic. A, I had it about, all. But... <laughs> uh, is this about a big change in society? But it's, it's as much about privilege as anything else. I'm very, I mean, when I... I've always I've always loved fantasy. I've always wanted to write fantasy and fantasy is going through science fiction fantasy. Like most genre, it's going through a big change where uh, you're seeing much more diverse readers, uh, writers coming through. And a lot of that is down to self-publishing as well. Things like Wattpad and things like that, where people who might not have felt they could approach a publisher uh, are now going out on their own. And that's fantastic. And I did sit down and think, what? the world needs now is yet another fantasy novel by yet another white middle class middle aged bloke you know what can i bring to this that's different and i saw the um uh the film headhunters which is based on the book by yo nesbo where you've got a character who's got everything a guy called roger he's an art dealer and he's very rich he's got a beautiful wife beautiful house he's very wealthy and he he's just not happy and yo nesbo tortures him for about 350 pages i thought that's what i need i need an anti-hero i need someone who has always had it his own way 
And if you're a white bloke, you've always had it your own way. And let's take all that away from him. And that's what it became about, uh, to get a bit A-level English literature about it. But, you know, that's that's what I wanted. I wanted to, uh, you know, take someone who, who thinks they've had it their own way and then just grind them down and see who they really are. Um, but there's a couple of other characters as well. There's a freelance mage who has a very high moral code. And can you still have a moral code when you don't have magical powers, when you can't lord it over people? And then there's a young boy who is completely, he has no voice. Uh, he is mute and when magic goes he changes more than anyone and it becomes about him having the power all of a sudden what does he do with that power so yeah but you know sounds a bit heavy going but it's fun it's fun there's dragons there's wyverns there's big battles there's um you know uh all kinds of it's page turning stuff so uh i had a, I had a great time writing it and the early feedback i'm getting already has been really really good so yeah Good. Well, we would definitely wish you luck with that, Mark. Um, Thank you. Just a few days away now. I'm not sure when the podcast will go out, so it will definitely be available in all good retailers uh, by the time the podcast goes out. So to round us off, your challenge for this year, and if people want to listen along on the Bestseller Experiment podcast, is to get 10,000 copies of the book sold by Glastonbury, which is a big music festival in the UK, which is when? August, is it? (laughs) 30th of June. Oh, I wish it was August. Oh, it's early. It's early. <laughs> oh, so it's the halfway point of the year. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so are you, are you knees, as I'll be polite and say knees deep in um, in AMS, adverti- adver- Amazon advertising and Facebook ads yeah. now? Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. I said, I've been doing Mark's course. Uh, it's um, It's been really helpful. Really, really helpful. Uh, I I got to say, though, one of the most helpful things is going on the Facebook group and just talking to people who've done it as well. Just having those conversations, because it's one thing seeing a course on a screen and making notes, but just having a conversation with someone uh, is invaluable. Um, you know, just uh, saying to them, does this happen to you as well? And they go, yeah, oh, all the time. Or, oh, good, it's not just me being rubbish. It does, you know, there, there is an issue with this. There is a problem with that. Uh, have you tried this? No, I haven't. You know, just that back and forth is really, really helpful. And, uh, yeah, lots to learn, lots and lots to learn. But, um, you know, it's some, um, we've got some momentum going now. It's a trickle at the moment, but I'm hoping by the time Glastonbury comes around, it'll be a, like a big boulder. So uh, we'll wait and see. And do you think you've made your big decisions about how to pitch it and where to pitch it? Or are you still evolving that? Constantly evolving, constantly trying different ads out, different ad sets, uh, seeing what gets click through, seeing what gets a good response, um, you know, uh, and keeping the faith with some of them as well. Because, you, you know, you know, it's like of AMS ads uh, or Amazon ads, you know, you, you can't switch it on and expect a big spike th- day one you've got to wait a few days you know you've got to wait and see what happens and uh the temptation is always to breathe as someone once said to me exactly yeah you gotta and you gotta keep the faith and um uh, and resist tinkering with them you know so it's um yeah lots lots to learn but uh, i'm enjoying it i mean the thing is even if we don't hit that target we will have learned something and we will take that on to the next project. And I'm working on a couple of new things now for the future. You know, I've got a new book. I've got a new script I'm working on. Um, and certainly for the books, you know, that that's what I'm learning now is gold. And it's a bedrock for, for whatever comes down the road. So, you know, I see a lot of um, authors on, on the uh, SPF group and on our group. You know, they, they expect boom miracles overnight and it's not this is a constant learning process it's constantly changing uh one of the big lessons we've learned is you have to be part of a community as well you can't expect to dip in and out you have to be have to live in that village and ask questions and speak to your neighbors and 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 uh see what the weather's like today you know because things change all the time amazon you know will at a whim suddenly decide to launch something they've been working on for years they haven't told anyone about but they're saying oh we're going to do it this way now and everyone's well well, how do we do this how do we do so we all start talking to each other and that's one of the joys of indie publishing i think is that we are willing to share this stuff yeah i completely agree and um you've got to think uh, about the old days in the traditional published building somebody joins the team and their job is to market the books but sitting next to them is someone who's been doing it for 25 years and around the corner someone who's been doing it for the last two years and we don't have that you know you start this cold so you do absolutely need to be a member of the community and both of us i think in our podcasts and our facebook groups are are providing that at the moment which is great 
Mm, absolutely. And it's 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 the thing I've loved the most, you know, and it is how the ind- and I can tell you from working on the other side of things, uh, the big publishers are taking notice of that of that as well. They um they know there are communities out there and they have to be part of those communities. And it it's it's going to change the way uh, books are published. We see, you know, we spoke on on the bestseller experiment to Girl Friday uh, Productions, who are, you know, out in the states, who are a completely new way of publishing, and they're all people who work for the big publishers, got frustrated with the way they were working and struck out on their own. And you're going to see a lot more of that. It's become much more of a hybrid thing. There are going to be all these different routes to market because that's been the biggest change. I mean, eBooks have. Uh, you can talk about oh, ebooks were a revolutionary format, but the really big thing that's changed is how authors talk to their readers. It used to be a long line. It would be it would be author, agent, publisher, bookseller, you know, and then the reader. And now you can either skip over all of those, or it's a kind of a cracked, uh, you know, a cracked mirror uh, of uh, you know you can you can talk to the wholesaler, you can talk to the bookstore, you can t- you can do all these things. And like I say, if you want to be an author in the 21st century, you really need to get your head around this stuff. Yeah, great. Well, I think we've moved people a little bit closer to it in just this chat, Mark. So thank you very much. So. Are you going to Glastonbury, by the way? This is just some random <laughs> moment you've chosen from the year. Well, because the book Climax is at Glastonbury, we, we plucked that out of the air. Um, I, uh, DeVoe keeps talking about going back to Glastonbury. Uh, there was talk of streaking across the stage at one point. I... You know, I just just keep listening and and you'll learn uh, what we'll we'll actually be doing. But I doubt it, to be honest. But uh, yeah. yeah, we'll see. We'll okay. see. <laughs> okay, Mark, thank you so much indeed for joining us. We should just let people know where they can find the various bits and pieces of mainly, of course, the Bestseller Experiment podcast. Uh, yeah, well, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher and uh, Spotify and all the usual uh, places. Uh, we're at bestsellerexperiment.com. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at bestsellerxp. And Facebook, we're Bestseller Experiment. And you can find me, I'm on Twitter at Mark Stay and Instagram at Mark Stay. And uh, my website is Mark Stay Writes. So come and say hi. It's been brilliant to have you on, Mark. Uh, really good fun. We'll catch up again in the future. Good luck. My pleasure, James. Thank you. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So that's Mark and Mark. Well, that's Mark. From the bestseller experiment. I'm uh, Mark. Talking about What's going on? your Mark. Talk about the other Mark. There are, and then these two podcasts in the indie space that emanate from the United Kingdom, there are three Marks. It's like the Marks Brothers. That's, that's very true. Yeah. And also, if you think about the SPF, um, uh, is Matthew, you know, we haven't got Matthew, we've got Mark, no. John. We've we got a Matthew or a Luke. We've, we don't Matthew, have, we, Mark. We have, we have John, James, John, and Mark. That's it. So, kind of three. Disciples. Are they disciples? I'm not sure. Yeah, Who, knows? So. I have a, Who knows? I, have a, I always remember that what the disciple called James, I think, I thought I was really disappointed to read in the Bible when you're a kid and you learn these things, that he was called something like Peter, but there was already a Peter, so they called him James, thinking, I thought he was a real James. Disappointed. Did that, was that crushing? It was crushing. I feel a bit bad. Uh, yeah, we're looking, for, <laughs> we're looking for Luke's. Who else? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. How did we get onto this, James? Uh, do you know what? Because at least once a month, somebody emails us to point this out. That's true. Yes. And uh, <laughs> anyway, other... it's my it's my fault. I got, I, it's my fault. I got us onto this diversion. And I should say that other religions are available. They are. That's right. <laughs> All no religions. Uh, we don't judge, although somebody might be judging. Um, <laughs> now let's talk about the bestseller experiment for a moment. So it's been uh, it's been exactly the sort of thing that people find useful is to hear the trials and tribulations and we have you have alluded to this we had this conversation yesterday and you made the point which I think was very good it's not just about the nuts and bolts of getting it right it's a bit more than that when you listen to somebody going through this process yeah exactly so it, it is it's a it's a good podcast they um they set out to, to write a bestseller uh, when they started and and then they they did that now i mean it's I'm going to caveat that very, very slightly, and then I'm going to kind of undercut that caveat. So they they got a bestseller, but they some of those orange tags were in, let's say, less competitive categories. Um, so, and I'm not I'm not downplaying what they did at all. But what what you do see sometimes these days is people will you know thinking of what Alex um, Newton from Kalytics told us uh, when he came on, they will look for very 
underserved categories, sometimes with with a handful of books in them. And the example that he gave was um, well, you, you uh, was mi- hang Duck. on, you missed the best example because I, I did. So the one on the podcast was Duck Decoys, wasn't it? It was yeah. woodworkers for duck decoys, and there's basically one book in there. So you could release a book tomorrow, sell one to your mum, and get the best and you will, orange tag. You will get the orange tag. Um, and then on the webinar that James did, yes. James did. It was, a, it was a rippled torso, which I could show you, but I'm going to keep my T-shirt on. A rippled ripped. torso, ripped torso, that's right. Or a rippled, ripped, six-pack, seven-pack, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> obviously, you know, steamy romance. Guy holding a monkey wrench or spanner, I think we'd call it in the UK. And the guy who'd got it, a bestseller tag in the woodwork and carpentry list. I like that. That's, yeah. that's clever. No, it's, not, it's, not particularly, um, it's not particularly best-sellery. But it is quite clever. Uh, it's, anyway, it, can I just so, mention this? So I did. I did. I meant to ask Alex this on the webinar. Uh, Alex Newton from Kalytics. It's it's a little bit devious. But is there a marketing benefit to just being able to get that orange tag and use that, even if it, you have circumvented the system a bit? Uh, well, it, it feels it feels a bit sleazy to me. Um, I, I don't really. I think. I mean, technically, yeah, they are a best. They, that person with the monkey wrench, um, or the person who wrote the book with the monkey wrench, the guy on the cover, that he he or she would be a bestseller by Amazon's definition. By anyone else's definition, selling two books does not make you a bestseller. So, um, now that's absolutely not what I'm, what the two marks did. Um, but you know, they 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 charted highly in some uh, more trafficked categories. But what I think is more interesting is what they're doing now, um, and. Their new project is, you know, they're setting themselves financial goals, which is much more relevant. So it's, it's much more, it means more. So you'll know, you know, I, I, you wouldn't necessarily know how many copies it took to hit uh, to get the orange tag in a smaller category. But what they're doing now is kind of what we've done in the past um, is is kind of lay out the numbers and actually show people what the numbers are um, and it's just it's it's a much more accountable way of doing things so kudos to them and I, you know and i hope i hope they hit their targets but it's a it's a good show and the two of them um obviously have fun doing it and and that comes through when you listen as well so it's, it is it's one that's on my um i've subscribed to the the show and i will drop in on it every now and again yeah i mean ultimately you can't pay your mortgage with orange ticks orange tags that's very true. Yeah, you do need to, you know, get some sales. Absolutely. So, Which is what yeah, their focus they, is they this are, year. They are so, definitely doing that. So we are in uh, end of March, and they've got until the end of June, I think, to hit their targets this year, which is, um, I think, Mark was gulping a little bit at uh, what lay ahead of them. Having done it before, they know that. Good. I think that might be it, Mark. I'm off to Centre Park's this weekend which is the uk actually it's kind of european thing i think it's belgian originally or dutch or something um Mm. it's basically a screaming filled water park and bungalows in a forest in a forest but i'm actually looking forward to it being busy three weeks for us Um, yes and we can relax and it's straight back into the edit for the bestseller course next week and we've got some good podcasts we've been going through the um, podcast schedule the self-publishing show schedule, I should say, for the future. And you've got this idea of doing a really uh, brilliant week, which we're just trying to set up a very highly targeted practical week for writers uh, who are in the midst of trying to sell books. Um, so we'll be looking at the three key areas that you need to understand and need to be on top of. And I think the idea at the moment is we'll probably do that within one week, the three shows. Yeah, three be three shows in one week. So Mon- Monday, Tuesday, when, no, th- Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, we'll look at Facebook with hopefully with an author who I think is doing very well with Facebook ads, um, BookBub, possibly with Adam Croft or possibly with David Gogren, not not quite sure yet. One of those two will talk about BookBub ads and then Amazon ads. That will probably be me, I expect. Um, but we will put those together and kind of what's working, what isn't working right now on those three platforms. I will also will tie in, I think actually kind of advanced warning, when I go to Nink this year, that's what they've asked me to talk about is, is what's working um, right now in author marketing. So and those will be the three main platforms that, that I address. So yes, we're gonna we're gonna put that out in the <clears throat> the days immediately after the, the the launch of the ads course in May or June, whenever it is we decide to do it, we'll we'll slot those in there. Yes. And talking of Nink, which is in Florida in September, we're also hatching a plan to do the self publishing show live. So we're gonna have an audience. Yeah, because we we're sponsoring it this year. We're actually we, we're well, we're paying for an ad on their program, and and one of the benefits we didn't realize that we get is the use of a 
of a room at the conference hotel. So it might be quite nice. I'm not quite sure what we'll do yet. It'll either be a live show with uh, with like an audience, or it could be we invite 10 or 15 industry representatives and dump them in a room together and have a kind of a round table. Um, or maybe do, do both. I don't know. I'll lots of time to think about that. I, I'm planning comedy. Well, you you might plan comedy. Whether anyone laughs is a, is a completely different um, question. You could do some accents. A funny, you could, you could, a funny thing happens. You could be to Rory Bremner. <laughs> they don't know. Americans don't know who Rory Bremner is. They don't. I'm trying to think of a famous American impressionist. Who would be a famous American impressionist? I don't know. There must be some. Steve Carell is pretty good, isn't he? But he's yeah. not really. Anyway, who, who knows? Yeah. yeah. There's only one. There's only one Rory Bremner. Yes, that's true. Good. Okay, Mark, thank you very much indeed. And thank you um, for doing this twice, which happens occasionally. A little technical failure yesterday, but it's been, uh, I feel it's been as spontaneous and as natural as we did do yesterday. Almost. Yeah, almost. I wasn't quite, I was about 5% less funny today. Well, maybe 6% less funny. That's still pretty funny in my it's still, it's, By most people's standards, it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Great. Look, have a great week uh, writing and selling your books. Thank you so much indeed for listening. Don't forget, you can go to patreon.com if you want to support us at slash self publishing show. And that's it. We'll see you next week. So it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.